Okay, not yet. Got it. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. Um, so as Teng mentioned, the ANBUG uh, executive, uh, after the success of the, the sort of the town hall meetings that we had last year, looking at polarization analysis and reflectivity, uh, we wanted to also host uh, a set of, of lectures on inelastic neutron scattering. So uh, today will be the first of uh, four uh, inelastic town hall seminars, I guess you could call them. Um, today, my, my plan is to give uh, an overall introduction to inelastic scattering and the different capabilities we have at ANSTO. Uh, stay tuned in two weeks on the 21st of April because we'll have uh, Dehong Yu and Shinichiro Yano um, talking about time of flight scattering and triple axis spectrometers. Then I believe on the 5th of May, Anton Stamfel will uh, talk about backscattering, spin echo and filter spectrometers. And then on the 19th of May, um, Pablo and Richard will, will talk more on the computing side of inelastic neutron scattering, how computing can support um, or and is very necessary to understanding the inelastic neutron scattering results that we uh, obtain. Okay, that's not working. There we go. So this is the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering. I'm sure you'll all uh, recognise all of the instruments that are located around the guide hall and in the reactor beam hall. Uh, the instruments that we're going to focus on for this lecture series are the ones in green. So in the neutron guide hall, we have Pelican here and EMU right up the end. And then inside the uh, reactor beam hall, very close to the opal reactor so that they have really high flux, a Taipan and Seeker, which are our two triple axis spectrometers. And here's some nice photos of what they look like. So Taipan is a thermal triple axis spectrometer. Seeker is a cold neutron triple axis spectrometer that was actually designed, built and is operated um, by the Taiwanese group from NSRRC. Um, Pelican is a time of flight spectrometer, as you can see here with this massive detector uh, bank in this evacuated tank. And EMU is this glorious backscattering spectrometer with huge silicon uh, crystals all over this back wall here. Um, coming back to Taipan in 2017, um, we decided that we wanted to augment uh, the, the use of this spectrometer uh, which can reach energies up to 200 milli electron volts. So not only do we have this thermal triple axis that we can put on, we can um, essentially plug and play. We can take the thermal triple axis off um, and install a beryllium filter, which also makes um, full use of the, the full dynamic and uh, energy range that we have uh, at Taipan. And I'll talk about all of these today. And here is the team of inelastic neutron scattering scientists at ANSTO. So um, you will hopefully see these people around the guide hall um, or in the neutron beam hall. So we have myself here. Um, we've got Guo Chu Deng, Shinichiro Yano. Also as part of the Taiwanese team, we've got Charlie Wu and Hans Peng. Um, and we have Anton Stamfel down here. Um, on Pelican, we've got De Hong Yu and Richard Moll. And uh, for EMU on the backscattering spectrometer, Nicola D'Souza and Alice Klaproth. Um, so welcome to the team. So today I'd like to uh, start off our talk uh, a little bit about what are fundamental excitations in solids and what can they tell us about our materials? Why do we care about dynamics? Why do we wanna know about these things? Um, I'm gonna make some simple steps to compare elastic scattering with inelastic scattering. I can understand and appreciate that not, a, not everybody joining us today is a physicist. Um, so I'm gonna take things back a bit and try and simplify things a little bit. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about these different techniques that we have and the different purposes we might want to use them for. Um, and of course, I've got some examples here. While I'm talking for these first couple of slides, keep this little picture in mind um, where we have atoms, solid balls that are connected together by what looks like springs. So keep that in mind. So before we, before we go on, I wanted to sort of take a step back to, you know, what is a phonon? We talk a lot about phonons, you know, their dynamics and materials, but what is a phonon? Well, let's let's take it 
way back from wiki um, it comes from the greek word phone <laughs> which translates to sound or voice and you can see that in english we use this word phone uh, to name a lot of things telephone saxophone megaphone headphone so it it means sound and so a phonon is essentially uh, the propagation of sound through a material so the way this happens is that we get a collective motion of atoms which can therefore propagate sound in fact um taking it a step further back i say that phonons are a way to propagate information so excitations are a way to propagate or, or transfer information through a material be it sound be it heat be it a spin state so um, collective excitations can transmit um, information through a material. Um, so if we want to uh, look seriously, phonon is a quantum mechanical description of the vibration of atoms uh, in a lattice. Um, and it was first introduced by the Soviet physicist Igor Tam in 1932. So a relatively recent uh, uh, concept. So I mentioned before, have a look at the, the diagram where the atoms are balls and we seem to have springs between them. So if you're a chemist, you might look at um, atomic structures with, with straight lines between your atoms and you call them your bonds. But um, when we're looking at dynamics or inelastic scattering, um, we think about these bonds uh, similar to springs. And now um, springs similar to like a slinky, <laughs> have different spring constants and can be described by um, a harmonic oscillator model or Hooke's law. So depending how stiff your uh, spring is between your atoms um, will tell you how much the atoms can vibrate away from each other. If you have a really loose spring between your atoms, maybe your atoms can vibrate um, away from each other quite, quite significantly. So essentially we're looking at springs as the bonds between atoms um, and describing the way they oscillate with respect to their neighbors um, using a harmonic oscillator idea. Um, if we want to look in a three dimensional model, you can see down here these green dots. This is showing us sort of some lattice vibrations or phonons in, in a system where we get uh, a peak or a high density of atoms together um, and a, a trough or, or a um, uh, a less dense region of atoms, um, where the distance between the two peaks is your, your wavelength. So we can describe our, our phonons in terms of the way that the atoms um, oscillate with respect to each other. So we could have something called a longitudinal wave or a transverse wave. So if you can see my slinky on the, on the, um, on the screen here, a longitudinal wave is when the peaks move along the direction of the atoms, whereas uh, a transverse wave, which you can't see because of my background, <laughs> um, are moving uh, perpendicular to the direction of the wave. Um, and certainly measuring phonons in our materials can tell us about um, bonding in our materials um, and harmonicity. So if we if we say that we're describing it as an harmonic oscillator, can we have an an harmonicity? And what does this mean? Um, if we're going through a structural phase transition, changing the symmetry group of our material, what's happening with the phonons and how is it mediated by the, the lattice vibrations? Um, what sort of many body physics we can describe, electron phonon coupling. Um, and we can also relate phonons uh, to other uh, properties such as superconductivity, um, and anomalous lattice expansions. And again, just remember, phonons is a transmission of, of um, information like sound or, or um, heat. So when we're having a look at neutron scattering relative to other techniques, I like to show this because you can see that there is um, a significant overlap when we're looking at length scales. So if we want to measure length scales in materials, um, the distance between atoms, for instance, you can see that there's a strong overlap between neutrons, X-rays, electron diffractions, and other scanning techniques. Mm. Uh -huh. However, when we start opening up this diagram to involve a time scale or an energy 
energy scale, you can the overlap is less obvious. In fact, this center of our diagram right here um, is really dominated by the realm of, of inelastic neutron scattering. To be able to see these sorts of length scales with these sorts of energies, um, we really do need inelastic neutron scattering. However, they are complementary um, to other spectroscopy uh, techniques like Raman, terahertz, infrared, NMR. Um, but of course, we get most of this region of our uh, phase diagram uh, with inelastic neutron scattering. And so here's some of the things that we can measure. You've got different length scales on the left and different time or energy scales on the right, the times of particular motions and what we can, um, how we can observe them, whether it's through something like backscattering spectroscopy with something like EMU or time of flight or three axis spectroscopy. So how can neutrons see dynamics? Well, that's quite interesting because um, now I've taken this slide um, courtesy of, of Roger Pinn, um, who says, okay, he, he put this slide together to sort of um, highlight uh, the recipients of the 1994 Nobel Prize. So the recipients of that prize were Clifford Schull, located in the top here, and Bert Brockhaus here. Um, and they essentially won their Nobel Prize for essentially describing how neutrons can see uh, atoms and dynamics in materials, particularly with a, a three axis or a triple axis spectrometer. So for diffraction measurements, we usually have a source of neutrons, a crystal that will monochromate these, select a wavelength or an energy, and then the location of the atoms in the crystal will then diffract. We move our detector around and we can see uh, a pattern which we can relate to uh, atomic spacing uh, in our materials. But the neutrons not just uh, scattering elastically from our material to tell us where the atoms are located. Um, if we have something like a triple axis spectrometer, then we can select a, uh, an incident wavelength or energy and also select a scattered wavelength or energy. And by analyzing our energy, we can see energy transfers in our material. So looking at this in a slightly different way, what, what do we see with elastic versus inelastic scattering? So uh, over here, again, elastic is the time averaged static position of your atoms. I'm trying to be careful with the words I'm using here, time averaged static position of your atoms um, or magnetic moments. And this leads to uh, energy independent um, uh, peaks, which we call Bragg peaks. And you can see down here in our SFQ and Omega, we expect quite intense, sharp features, which are our Bragg peaks um, at different Q vectors, but all at Omega or energy equals zero. When we're looking at inelastic coherent, now we're looking at the motion. So the way that these atoms vibrate with respect to each other. And you can see that the SFQ and Omega is really quite different. Um, Instead of everything being focused at energy zero, we see an energy dependence. Uh, it shows this nice periodic type um, wave function or dis display of dispersion. Um, and it's a lot weaker typically than the elastic scattering. If we wanna talk about this in terms of um, what's happening with the neutrons. For elastic scattering, if a neutron comes in with one energy and comes out with the same energy, then we say it's elastically scattered. It hasn't lost or gained any uh, energy to the system. So when our neutron enters a system, enters our sample, for example, and it scatters with more energy than it came in with, that means it must have taken that energy from somewhere. So what's happened is it's taken energy away from these phonons. So it's stopped the phonon from vibrating in our sample. And it's taken that discrete amount of energy um, as it's scattered. And we can measure that neutron energy gain. Similarly with neutron energy loss, if we come in with a particular energy and we give some of this energy to the system to, to start the atoms vibrating and oscillating, then the neutron will then scatter with less energy. And the amount of energy that the neutrons have lost must be the amount of energy that they've deposited in the system to excite uh, these vibrations, phonons or magnons. Um, I have a little uh, asterisk up here. Uh, elastic scattering is not the same as diffraction. I'm just gonna leave that there and we can come back to that at the very end if anyone has a question about why that might be. 
Okay, so we've talked a little bit about this scattering function, which we call S of Q and omega. Um, so we're measuring, in fact, the number of scattered neutrons as a function of reciprocal space and energy transfer. So the Q is reciprocal space, the omega is energy transfer. And so we see this as a sum of both the incoherent parts and the coherent parts. And what this looks like when we, when we plot it, if we plot it versus energy, we'll see an elastic line centered at omega equals zero. And so these, these come from Bragg peaks or incoherent scattering. We can also get some quasi-elastic scattering. Now, quasi-elastic scattering is quite interesting because it is inelastic, but it is centered at omega equals zero. So it's an inelastic feature that's centered at omega equals zero. We also get inelastic features. You can see here on our neutron energy loss, we have two features and our neutron energy gain, we have the same two features. And the reason is to excite a phonon or de-excite a phonon requires the same amount of energy. That energy is a discrete packet of energy. Um, but of course we need different thermal factors whether we can excite or de-excite. So if a neutron comes into a material that's sitting at one Kelvin, there's not a lot of thermal energy in that material. And so the phonons aren't already vibrating. So we're not going to see any neutron energy gain if we haven't populated enough of our phonon modes. So to give you an idea, if you want to observe a feature at one milli electron volts, you'll need at least 11 Kelvin worth of energy. Uh, in your system. If you want to see something at 30 milli electron volts, you'll need to be sitting close to room temperature. If you want to see neutron energy gain, that is. So um, we, can, we can study a variety of different, uh, uh, different excitations in materials. So phonons are just one of them. Um, and these we can define as either acoustic or optical, and I'll show you what that means on the next slide. Um, we can also look at vibrations uh, in molecules. So torsion or rotation um, or, or translation even. We can also look at diffusion. And I've got an example that I'll show at the end that talks a little bit about diffusion through a material, how we can get smaller atoms to diffuse um, through a lattice. Um, and we can also look at collective modes in glasses and liquids. So again, these are the sorts of things that these excitations can tell us about. Phase transitions, critical phenomena, um, superfluids even, um, and types of interactions in our system. So this is um, something that I've been looking at a little bit recently is, is the not so fundamental excitations. We're sort of quite familiar with how neutron scattering is measuring phonons and magnons. Um, we can see these as fundamental excitations in our materials, but we have other special excitations which may also be observed uh, through neutron scattering. Um, these are phasons, amplitudons and solitons. So phasons are quite interesting. I've been reading about this a lot recently. Um, it's considered a quasi-particle in a quasi-crystal with a quasi-periodic lattice. So essentially, we're not looking at a periodic lattice um, that is a commensurate structure, but something that's incommensurate. Um, and you can look this up on Wikipedia. But what's quite interesting about phasons is um, they can actually uh, transmit or move faster uh, than the speed of sound in a material. So they're um, a faster way of... Um, uh, heat transfer than, than phonons uh, usually are. Um, but they are a lot weaker, uh, about an order of magnitude weaker uh, in intensity than, than phonons. Um, amplitudons are amplitude modes of a charge density wave. Um, and so there's a nice little um, uh, paper down the bottom here that I, I talk about. Um, and finally, we've got solitons, which are just single solitary waves, which maintain its shape and amplitude as it um, progresses. And it, this is very similar to how a water wave might look in a soliton. Okay, so optic and, and acoustic phonons. So optic sounds like something you can see. And the optic modes were actually defined by... Um, these optic modes could be excited in ionic crystals uh, just using light. Um, light techniques. And so these optic modes, which were first observed in these ionic crystals, um, 
were called optic modes because they were excited by this um, applied light. Acoustic modes sounds like sound, um, and you're exactly right. Acoustic mode um, indicates that we can define the speed of sound in our material by looking at the slope of this acoustic mode. You can see that these acoustic modes, um, they propagate out of energy equals zero or out of a Bragg peak. So in reciprocal space, we call this Bragg peak position the gamma point. Um, and so acoustic modes are always propagating out from our gamma point. Um, so how many modes should we expect in our materials? You see all these phonon propagation drawings. How many should we expect? So there's some math down the bottom here, quite simple math, um, that if we have n atoms per unit cell, there are three times n branches. So if I have one atom in my unit cell, three, the first three have to be acoustic. So if I just have copper or aluminium, then I only have acoustic phonons. The rest of them are optic. So if I have four atoms in my unit cell, the first three are acoustic. The next nine are therefore um, optic, optic modes. Let me show you what that looks like. Oh, okay. So how do we how do we take these measurements? I guess that's a that's a question. Um, if we want to see a dispersing mode, like we might he see here, where we see these um, principal positions in a Brillouin zone. Again, now we're talking really in reciprocal space here, not real space, but reciprocal space. We need to take measurements along uh, along this dispersive surface. So a measurement might look like this. Gives us a peak here. We can put that peak on our diagram here. So just to um, refresh your memory on Brillouin zones, again, we're looking in reciprocal space. The Brillouin zone center is the gamma point or the location of the Bragg peak. It could be a 111, it could be a 200, um, but th essentially the Bragg peak is your gamma point. The Brillouin zone boundary is the mid point between two gamma points. So, uh, as you can see in this A and B, the Brillouin zone has been defined by these midpoints between gamma points or between, between Bragg peaks. Um, so that's how we're defining uh, the Brillouin zone center and the Brillouin zone boundary. And, and yeah, let's have a little look. So let's have a look at copper. So copper is a FCC cubic lattice, again, just one atom in the unit cell. So we only have acoustic modes. Um, L stands for the longitudinal and T is the transverse waves. And so again, this um, slope is related to the group velocity or the speed of sound traveling in the material along that direction. And so here we can see um, uh, along the longitudinal that speed is, uh, the speed of sound is uh, quicker along that longitudinal direction. Um, it's also uh, quicker along this 0, 0, 001 direction than along these other directions, which have less steep uh, dispersion surfaces. So how do we interpret? There's got a lot of symbols on this sort of diagram. How, how do we interpret this? Um, along the y-axis, we have uh, energy, frequency, energy, same thing. Um, along the bottom, we're looking at reduced wave vector. So talking about re reciprocal space, if we have a look at this picture on the left here, we could go from the 111 to the 222 meaning that we're changing H, K, and L. So it's going along this direction, the half, half, half reduced wave vector direction. Along the top, we have these principal uh, positions in a Brillouin zone. And just for your uh, reference, these big gamma points are our um, Bragg peaks. So if we were to move along the OOL, um, that's going from gamma to X. As we move on to a, another example now with two, two atoms in the unit cell, um, we see we've got our three acoustic modes down the bottom and our three uh, optic modes up the top. Um, this is another way you can show a, a Brillouin zone in a three-dimensional representation um, where, where what you're seeing are the Brillouin zone boundaries um, with principal directions listed, uh, as you can see here. Um, one example I want to show is, is uh, of a C60 buckyball. So this is just a carbon 60 molecule, this massive structure with a big gap in the middle. Um, 
And from this, this nature paper, they showed that um, intercalating potassium into this um, would change the vibrational modes um, such that they could indicate that this was a superconducting um, system. So these, these modes down here at very high energy transfers of around 120 milli electron volts um, indicated that um, those sorts of vibrations were important uh, for the superconductivity in this material. We've talked a lot about lattice vibrations and atomic vibrations, but what about magnetic spin excitations? Now, this is, um, uh, as Teng mentioned in the introduction, this is a, uh, something that is really close to my heart, something that I do a lot of research into. What I like about magnetic spins is um, a magnetic spin is just like a vector quantity. It's just like an arrow. It's a magnetic moment that points in a particular direction. And when we talk about magnetic spin excitations, we're not talking about moving the atom that has the spin associated with it. All we're doing is talking about moving the vector direction of our magnetic spin. So if we take a, a chain here of ferromagnetically ordered spins and we wanna flip one of these spins, it's not very energetically favorable. This one doesn't wanna be opposite all of its neighbors. What's more energetically favorable is instead of flipping one spin, we can set them all oscillating uh, to make a to make a wave. And so this is exactly what we see in a lot of situations that instead of flipping one spin, we end up forming a spin chain or a magnon um, in three dimensions. So um, the nice thing, uh, if we're talking about uh, motivation or, or technological, uh, technological outputs that could come about from magnetic uh, uh, manipulation, if you like, um, we can transmit information through these spin chains. Um, and because we're not moving atoms, we're just moving vector directions, there's no resistance. So we can get a lot of um, uh, fast speed uh, transmission of information through these spin chains, which is quite important for the field of spintronics, which is becoming quite exciting at the moment. So we can, we can observe these spin waves um, in, in magnetic systems with neutron scattering because the neutron itself has a magnetic moment, it has a spin, and the spin interacts with the spins in our, in our system. And so it can excite uh, magnons or spin-ons, and it can de-excite as well. So we can, we can observe the same sort of excitations, but just through um, the interaction of the, the spin of the neutron with the spins in our system. So we can, we can see things like you know, quantum spin fluctuations, crystal fields, spin orbit excitations, all of these we can see. Um, I won't have too many equations in this in this talk, but here's one that's quite important. It's a Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is used to describe J, which is the exchange interaction between spin L and its neighbor spin L plus one with a, a Zeeman applied field Zeeman term on the end. Um, magnetic neutron scattering, inelastic neutron scattering is one of the only techniques of directly measuring this J, this exchange interaction between spins. Um, and so that makes it a really important tool. Magnetic inelastic neutron scattering is a really important tool um, for investigating all these things, the exchange interaction, um, any anisotropies or preferred orientations in our um, magnetic interactions, um, phase transitions and critical phenomena, um, quantum fluctuations, um, and we can also observe things like spin phonon coupling. So let's, um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Okay, let's move on and start talking about some of the techniques that we've got at ANSTO. So we have at ANSTO two triple axis spectrometers. Sika, as I mentioned, it was um, designed and built by the Taiwanese and Taipan. Now Taipan is a thermal triple axis. We have two monochromators, um, which can reach up to 80 and 200 milli electron volts. So we've got a full range up to 200 milli electron volts. Um, energy transfer on Taipan. So very thermal, short wavelengths. We have a res resolution of about one milli electron volt on Taipan. Sika is quite a unique triple axis. Um, many cold neutron triple axis have a very restricted energy range, but because of the way that Sika is positioned uh, on the reactor face, we can actually reach energy transfers up to 25 milli electron volts. Most cold cold triple axis may get to 12. So Sika has a, a really nice range up to about 25 milli electron volts. Um, 
it has an order of magnitude better resolution than Taipan. So if you want to look at very low energy features, Seeker is the way to go. If you want to look at excitations at higher energies, then Taipan is the way to go. And I've got Bert Brockhaus up here. Um, remember, he's the 1994 Nobel Prize winner who received the prize for his work on TAS instruments and designing and building and coming up with a TAS instrument. So um, triple axis spectrometers, I think, are one of the most versatile um, instruments uh, that we have. Um, they can be modified and, and um, uh, uh, aligned, I guess, to, to measure lots of different things. So how do they work? Triple axis, there's got to be three axes, right? What are those three axes? The first axis is our monochromator. Our monochromator is just a set of crystals that are highly reflective of neutrons and they reflect just one wavelength. So we come from our reactor source, the opal reactor, with a white beam of neutrons and one energy or one wavelength is selected from that monochromator. So that's the first axis. The first time the neutrons interact is with the monochromator. The second time is our sample. Now, our sample can be a single crystal, it can be a polycrystal, it can be an ingot, it can be a thin film, it can be so many different things. But of course, the neutrons interact um, with the atoms in our crystal. So that's the second axis of, uh, uh, of scattering. The third axis is the analyzer. Now, in the case of Seeker and Taipan, the analyzer is also PG002, pyrolithic graphite. Um, and it does the same thing. It actually selects the wavelength which will head towards the detector. So I asked the question on an earlier slide, what's the difference between elastic scattering and diffraction? Once the neutrons have interacted with a, a sample, everything is scattered at the same time. So we get phonon scattering, we get Bragg scattering, we get diffuse scattering, incoherent scattering. There's so many things that scatter at the same time. And in a, diffract in a diffractometer like Wombat or Echidna, we just collect all of that scattering. We call it diffraction. So the neutrons have diffracted. Um, it just so happens on Wombat and Echidna that we're focusing on Bragg peaks, which are really strongly, uh, highly intense uh, features that we can, we can observe quite well. If we set our analyzer on a triple axis spectrometer to the same angle as our monochromator, we're selecting the same wavelength, then we can just isolate purely elastic scattering. Um, and this allows us to get rid of any sort of background from incoherent scattering or phonons or, or anything else that might be happening in our sample. And it allows us to measure elastically very weak features. So that's one nice thing about the triple axis spectrometer. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about inelastic scattering. So with inelastic scattering, if I set my monochromator to say 20 milli electron volts and I set my analyzer to 15 milli electron volts, if I see a peak, then I must have uh, left 5 milli electron volts uh, in my sample. So I've excited a phone on a 5 milli electron volts. And that's how that works. As I said, they're highly configurable and very versatile. We can put a lot of different um, uh, items in our beam, collimators, slits, uh, filters, um, to try and optimize the signal that we get. The reason is with a traditional triple axis spectrometer, we only have one detector. So uh, it can be quite a slow technique compared to other, other techniques, but um, we can very finely tune um, and optimize our scattering um, to get the best out of our um, uh, experiment from our sample. So scattering from the instrument um, has what we call a resolution. So every time the neutron passes through optics or interacts with something, um, it will have a certain um, resolution effect. So as it hits the monochromator, the sample and the analyzer, as it goes through collimation, um, uh, the neutrons will spread. Um, and this spread is called a resolution ellipsoid. So this is a three-dimensional sort of ob oblongy sphere, egg shape um, blob. And that is how our neutrons scatter, scatter from a triple axis spectrometer, from any instrument actually. Every instrument will have a resolution based on the optics in the beam. Um, this is important when we're looking at something called focusing versus defocusing on a triple axis spectrometer, because our resolution ellipsoid is fixed uh, to the um, 
to the orientation or scattering sense of our uh, instrument. Um, and this can lead to either seeing flat, broad peaks or sharp, high intensity peaks. Um, obviously seeing the sharp high intensity peaks will allow us to find the peak position much easier than in a defocused. So we always try and look for a focused position based on the um, resolution and the resolution function. What would a scan look like if we were to take some scans um, uh, of a single crystal, for example? Well, we can, we can measure in energy gain or energy loss. So typically for a triple axis spectrometer, we measure in energy loss um, in terms of processing the data and, and understanding the data. This is um, a, a far simpler means than neutron energy gain. There's extra factors involved when you look at neutron energy gain. Um, we could do, if we have a look, here's this really nice paper actually that, that came out in 2020, um, looking at hot carrier solar cells, um, methyl ammonia lead iodide, um, and they were looking at the phonons uh, in this material. Here's what their actual scans look like from a triple axis spectrometer and where they found peaks that they've labeled here, they've then been able to map out these dispersion um, curves. So here they've done constant Q energies. So they've sat say at point one and they've taken a scan vertical on this scale. But we could also do constant energy Q scans, particularly down here close to the gamma point. Um, and, and see things slightly differently. Um, again, we can work in ear fixed or EI fixed mode. Typically with Seeker and uh, Taipan, we work in ear fixed mode. Um, and by combining all the data from our triple axis, we can, we can come up with one, one of these plots like this. So this was some really nice data that I'll talk about in a minute. So let's talk about some um, experiments that were actually performed on Seeker and Taipan. Um, this is work of one of our instrument scientists, Guo Chu Deng, um, and I was helping with some of the Taipan work. Um, in this material, this was a, a material that was shown to have really strong magnetoelectric um, coupling. However, two previous publications came out to try and describe the magnetic moment structure, and neither of these were consistent with the idea of it being a magnetoelectric coupled material. So there was something going on with the static magnetic moment that was observed through diffraction. Um, it was, remember, it's a time averaged um, position of magnetic moments. So Guo Chu had this idea, if we study it with inelastic neutron scattering, we might be able to understand the magnetic structure through the interactions and through looking at the Hamiltonian. And so in um, A and B at the top, we can see all that beautiful data that's been collected on both um, Taipan and Seeker. Seeker was for the lower energy things and Taipan was for the higher energy features, particularly up here. Um, and by modeling using a linear spin wave theory model, um, he was able to show that there's a very strong um, uh, anisotropy. So it's actually a jaloshinsky maria anisotropy, which is like a ferromagnetic canting um, between these, these two cobalt ions. Um, and you can see that here by this Dij. And that this is so significant, it's even stronger than the, the nearest neighbor ferromagnetic interactions um, between these cobalt ions. So a really significant result that's come out from um, inelastic scattering. And this is now consistent with this picture of this material as magnetoelectric. So another material that um, I've been studying for many years, in fact, I studied this material um, way back in my PhD, I won't tell you how many years ago now. Um, this is often called a magnetic graphene-like honeycomb lattice. It's a van der Waals magnet um, and it's antiferromagnetic. So you can see here we have iron ions, Fe3 plus ions, um, making a honeycomb in the layer. And these are separated by this quite a big diff distance in the C direction, which is this van der Waal um, gap. So um, it's a very nice layered system. In fact, you can actually get um, scotch tape and you can, you can cleave it just like graphene. And so we can get monolayers and bilayers of this stuff, which is really quite interesting. Um, looking how the magnetic moments change when you go from a bulk to um, uh, monolayers and bilayers. But the question we were trying to answer was, what about interactions between these two layers? Are there any interactions between the layers? Um, from previous work, it was shown that interact this J dash, which is interaction between the layers, 
was not applicable, that there was no interaction between the layers, all the interaction, significant interaction was actually within the layers. However, combining triple axis from Taipan with some time of flight data, doing some detailed modeling, in fact, we did find that there was um, very small but still significant interactions um, between the layers. And this will have implications when we look at the bulk compared to when we look at these cleaved layers. If we want to implement this into um, a technology, um, how, will that, how will that change the way our, our spin structure sits? So again, a very nice result coming from Taipan there. I mentioned at the beginning that Taipan has also got an additional secondary spectrometer called the beryllium filter. So um, this is a uh, inelastic instrument um, that is tuned for looking at lattice molecular vibrations. Um, and so we essentially take a fingerprint um, of of powder samples and, and see their phonon density of states um, from these uh, measurements. So the Brilliant Filter is located in here. Um, this is seven ton of, of goodness. Our filter is made up of um, bismuth, beryllium, graphite, and additional beryllium. And these are all cooled um, to very low temperatures, below 40 Kelvin. Um, and you can see at the back here, we have about 30 detectors. So what happens with these filters, these filter blocks is that they only, it acts like a low bandpass filter. It only allows um, very low energies to reach the detector, around 1.8 milli electron volts. So again, using Taipan, the thermal triple axis that can have incident energies up to about 200 milli electron volts, we can suddenly see um, uh, a wide range of excitations, great for looking at phone on density of states, um, uh, all the way up to, um, I think it's about 1600 uh, wave numbers, if you're more used to that. Um, this table here indicates that there are other spectrometers around the world that are quite similar. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a new technique, but it's certainly um, quite an interesting technique. And in fact, one of the um, measurements we were performing with a group um, from Flinders, University in South Australia was looking at opals, measuring opals at opal. Um, so they were looking at opals that had been dug up from different places around the world. And they were showing that the quality of the opal um, as a precious gem um, changed around the world. Um, some of them were very brittle and would, would disintegrate very quickly. Others were quite solid, robust, would be long lasting. And so they wanted to know how the water in the systems um, uh, affected the, the brittleness or the, the hardness of these materials. So um, essentially we've, we've taken these measurements all the way up to 120 milli electron volts. We didn't need to go any further. Um, but what we wanted to do was compare our opals with what, what was available for um, hexagonal ice. So water ice and its hexagonal form. And we were able to show that we were we could see a significant amount of water in the samples that we were looking at. Um, and that the placement of this water um, is critical to the, the brittleness of, of the samples or the materials. And one hint that they said was don't buy opals from Ethiopia because that source appears to be the most brittle and crumbly. So if you're looking for jewelry for your uh, um, uh, loved ones, don't, don't buy them from Ethiopia. Time of flight scattering. Um, we have Pelican, which is our inelastic cold neutron time of flight scattering spectrometer. This is a beautiful instrument. I love Pelican. Um, it's another way to obtain inelastic data, um, but with very big data sets. So data sets collected on Seeker or, or Taipan, each data set might be a couple of um, kilobytes. Um, the data sets I typically collect from Pelican are about 15 gigabytes. So much bigger data sets. And I'll explain why that happens in a minute. Um, can also probe the dynamics in systems, including phonons and magnons. In a triple axis spectrometer, you need to look at a particular spot in Q and measure the energy of what's happening in, in Q and energy space. In Pelican, what's nice is because it's got such a big um, detector bank, we get a good snapshot of reciprocal space and energy in, in one picture. Um, so it's great for, um, I, I always say it's a nice survey tool. It's great for looking at your uh, system if you don't know exactly uh, where you want to start looking. Um, and it also gives absolutely beautiful data. 
Um, great for looking at um, self-correlation and pair correlation functions in polycrystalline sample diffusions, etc. Um, Pelican has two um, uh, two modes of operation typically, um, which they call lambda and lambda on two, um, and it depends on the phasing of the choppers, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, where for lambda, that's their high resolution mode or one of their higher resolution modes, which can measure up to three milli electron volt in neutron energy loss. Um, and for lambda on two, uh, they can measure up to around 12 milli electron volts uh, in neutron energy loss. But of course they can measure up to much higher energies uh, in neutron energy gain. Um, let's see how Pelican works. Here's a nice sort of schematic of Pelican. Um, you're looking at this screen, so you are the reactor and you're going to start sending your neutrons towards uh, this position here, which is the monochromator. The sample sits at this location uh, here uh, within a cryostat and the detectors are in this evacuated detector bank here. So let's see how this works. So we have a white beam of neutrons coming from our reactor source. It interacts with the triple monochromator to select just one wavelength or one energy. Um, this then goes through two different choppers, which will pulse our neutrons. So a chopper is just like a disc that's spinning. And in that disc, we have a hole. And when the hole lines up with the neutrons, neutrons can pass through. So we have well-defined pulses of neutrons that we can now, we know the timing of, we know when they reach the sample. When we know when they reach the sample, we can also then count how long it takes them to travel from the sample all the way to the detector. And you can see here, there's 200 one meter tall position sensitive detectors in an evacuated chamber here. So um, phenomenal amount of pixels and data that can be collected in any one go. Um, and again, they can see neutron energy loss and gain. So you remember I spoke earlier about a triple axis experiment that was looking at these hot carrier solar cells. Um, I think it was methyl ammonia lead iodide, triiodide. Um, one of the problems with these materials as a solar cell is that they're quite um, sensitive to uh, stability issues through humidity and temperature. There's an issue with their band gap. Um, and by combining iodide and bromine um, in, this, in this work here, um, using Pelican data, uh, they were able to show that they could cut out these higher energy um, bands and make it a, a smoother transition. So they could really tune um, uh, the band gap um, to help stabilize uh, and reduce the sensitivity of these materials to these, you know, these external influences. So now based on this result, new materials can be designed for um, new solar cells. Um, I have a student who's working with me at the moment on atacarmide. It's a low dimensional quantum magnet and it shows these beautiful dispersive um, modes. Um, atacarmide is quite interesting because it's got this quite extreme phase diagram with lots of different uh, magnetic moment phases as we apply fields up to you know, 30 Tesla and beyond. Um, so it's important for us to understand what's happening with the magnetic interactions and how we can best manipulate um, these uh, so that we could perhaps use them in, in technologies. And one way we can do that is by intercalating this atacarmite into a graphene um, structure. And by doing that, the atacarmite itself is an insulator, but we've now moved it into a, um, a reduced graphene oxide lattice. And so now we can start manipulating these spins and the, the orientation of our uh, magnetism um, through um, electrical pulses through through the, the graphene oxide. So this holds some potential for, for future technologies. I know I'm running out of time very quickly. Um, I'm not gonna mention this. I'm gonna go straight onto quasi-elastic scattering um, just cause I am running out of time and I wanna show you this lovely video of uh, EMU. So remember I mentioned quasi-elastic scattering. It's a special type of inelastic scattering that is centered at omega equals zero. So energy transfer of zero. You can still see it's got these uh, broad Lorentzian like tails or wings um, uh, that, that are inelastic. So our backscattering spectrometer that we have uh, is called EMU and I'm gonna just um, bring this here and press play. And you don't need to hear what's being said about it because I will talk you through. So the neutrons are coming from the reactor um, down through the, the neutron guide. So it's a white beam. 
it's it's got um, all wavelengths. They interact with the monochromator, and that doesn't appear to be moving. Why is that not moving? Oh dear. This always happens. This is the best video ever. I thought it was fine. I might have to just move on. No, okay. So, all right. So the neutrons have been monochromat, uh, gone through a monochromator. One wavelength goes through a chopper. You can see the disc spinning with holes in it. And this is pulsing the neutrons. Here we go. So now we've got pulses of neutrons, just like the time of flight. So these pulses come down the beam. They hit this next disc. See, they hit the disc and reflect back. This disc also has holes in it. Remember that for later. But our monochromatic beam of neutrons hit, hits this first disc and comes back into what's called a Doppler drive. Can you see this Doppler drive? It is moving backwards and forwards. As it moves forwards, it's going to push the neutrons uh, faster backwards. So it's going to give it a little offset in energy. As the Doppler drive moves backwards, it's going to let the neutrons scatter from it with less energy. So there's going to now be an energy range. And look, these ones now go through the hole. Oh my goodness, look at that feat of engineering. The, the reflected neutrons are going through the hole. Right, they then reach our sample, scatter off the sample onto these huge silicon wafers, silicon wafers that are then reflecting back into the detectors. Here we go, the neutrons are now scattering into the detector. With this, we can reveal very, very small, fine, high resolution changes in energy. So we can see very, very fine changes in energy. Um, uh, with EMU. So if I go back to this, um, we can see that EMU has a, a resolution of about um, one micro electron volt. Compared to um, Taipan, which has one milli electron volt, Pelican 100 micro EV, EMU is one micro EV. So very, very fine um, resolution. And here is a beautiful photo taken inside this, this big um, tank. You see the tank with the white polyethylene on the outside. And look at all these beautiful um, silicon crystals. That, that's where the backscattering is coming from. So the, the neutrons interact with the sample. They hit the silicon 111 and they backscatter into the detector. So absolutely beautiful, beautiful instrument. Um, so what can we do with this beautiful, beautiful instrument? We can look at things like um, uh, rotation and um, uh, uh, jump diffusion in materials. So um, this material is considered a molecular sieve. So it's got these large um, porous sections here and uh, certain molecules can um, uh, pass through these, these large pores, but it can also entrap um, other other gas molecules. So it acts like a sieve if you're sieving your um, self-raising flour, if you're making a cake, for instance. But when you put your flour into a sieve, you don't just hold the sieve there and hope everything falls through. You actually have to wiggle it and shake it to get the molecules or to get your flour to go through. And that's sort of what's happening here. So what they observe looking at both emu and pelican is that there's um, these rigid unit modes but there's also two types of quens. There's a slow quens and a fast quens. And only through molecular dynamic simulations um, were they able to see that these all coexisted, that they had to fit their, their data uh, with all of these modes um, to see what was happening and what was going on in the material. And in fact, two types of um, uh, vibrations are happening. Uh, we're getting a jump diffusion where atoms are jumping out and coming in. And we're also getting a, a torsion or a, or a rotation. So it's like it's like when you've got your sieve, you're sifting um, your flour, you have to, to wobble it around. Now we're able to show that there's this nice temperature dependence and take some nice fits um, to explain what was going on here. So I know we're finishing up very quickly, so I'm going to uh, quickly hurry up. Lots of things to, to think about when you're when you're taking measurements. Think about what sample environments you might need. Um, think about what spectrometer might be better for you. Um, a time of flight might be better for getting an overall picture of your material. A TAS might be better for a um, parametric uh, study where you're just changing magnetic field or changing temperature. Um, backscattering might be 
um, important to see very fine energy changes. Do you need other special requirements such as polarization analysis? Um, and before you jump in, we also need additional information about um, what your sample, um, what properties your sample has before you jump into inelastic. Inelastic shouldn't be the first uh, technique you choose. Um, our next proposal round will be next March. This September one um, is not going ahead. We know that there's um, three ways to get in, but we all go through the proposal round, I'm sure. Um, neutrons are a powerful tool. There are different techniques uh, for different purposes, and we can measure dynamics up to around 200 milli electron volt energy transfer with resolutions as fine as one micro EV. And all of the inelastic group staff are very happy to talk to you and help find a technique that is right for you. And I will stop right there, leaving this uh, ANBUG uh, adver advertisement there. <laughs> if you are not already a member of ANBUG, please consider joining today. Thank you. Oh, just in time. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Karani. So we still have, uh, okay, we still have some quick uh, Q and A session. Any questions? Ah, yeah. So we have the Joshua. Yeah. Do we have any questions? Ah, uh, no. I didn't have a question. I was just doing the little clapping emoji. Oh, hey! Uh, hey thanks, Josh. <laughs> uh, thank you. That was a really good talk. Um, I, yeah. Don't really yeah. have questions. <laughs> Thank you. I, I do. I do like your questions. Where 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 do Decepticons fit in? That that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's an on. Everything's an on. And, so and I got uh, yeah, Kerry. I got uh, one quick question about the coherent and the incoherent scattering. So mm. is there any good way to because in your PowerPoints, so we always see the uh, coherent stuff. So is there any good way to uh, identify or distinguish or filter this uh, coherent or incoherent? If I only want an incoherent or if I only want a coherent scanning, what should I do? Yeah. Yeah, they'll come up, they'll come up very differently. So for example, um, if, if your sample has any incoherent scattering, you will always see some incoherent elastic even if you're not sitting at a Bragg peak. So let me go back to ah, that one there. Here we go. Um, if we are taking one of these measurements, a neutron um, energy transfer measurement, if we take this at a Bragg position, say the 110, then this elastic peak will be coherent plus incoherent scattering from that Bragg peak. And it will be stonking. It will be huge, huge. Um, if we step away from the Bragg peak, maybe we go to something like the, instead of the 110, we go to the 1.1, 1.10, then we no longer have a coherent elastic scattering. So we no longer have um, a Bragg peak, which can often mask some of our quasi elastic scattering, but we do still have uh, incoherent elastic. So when you're taking an inelastic scan, even if you're nowhere near a Bragg peak, you'll still see strong intensity at the elastic line due to any incoherent scattering from your sample. So um, you do have to consider both incoherent scattering and coherent scattering. Um, and you can play tricks about where you are in Q um, or what elements you've got in your material um, to determine you know, whether, whether you've got coherent or incoherent scattering. Um, polarized neutrons could also help to um, uh, separate coherent and incoherent. Okay, thank you, Kiriti. No worries. Yes. Any more questions? Yeah. I, okay. I, yeah, no, that's good. Excellent. Yeah, so if no questions, we will end today's session. And please uh, join the AMBAC and to receive the updated information. So we will have more lectures in coming months. Okay, thank you for everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining.